Thank you so much, Rajesh. Uh, thanks to everyone at the Outlook Group for having me out here. I always uh, relish an occasion to come back to Delhi. And uh, I hope I can make the next uh, half an hour or so entertaining as well as uh, thought-provoking. I, I really enjoyed um, rereading Vinod Mehta's work in preparing for this. And it's, of course, a great honor to be selected to deliver the first lecture in his memory. I was uh, even the last few days reading his memoir, Lucknow. Boy, I don't know how many of you have had a chance to read it, but I recommend that it has a certain character about it that I really admire in the great journalist. He's not full of himself. He's full of humor, full of life, full of curiosity, very conversational, very accessible. And that, I think, is sometimes what it takes to reach audiences, and that sensibility on the other hand, was quite a serious one, very devoted to public interest journalism. Of course, all of us outside of India admire Outlook uh, very much as an exemplar of uh, the very best journalism in this country. As Rajesh mentioned, you know, I, I lived out here for three years over in Vasant Vihar as the Washington Post correspondent. I came out as a young uh, journalist, uh, really fired up to be out here and to work. I, was, I lived here between 1989 and 1992, and it was a time of considerable change in India and Indian politics. I think I covered four governments in three years. Uh, I may be one of the few Americans who knows that Chandrasekhar was, in fact, the Prime Minister of India. It may have only been for seven weeks, but um, it was an exciting time, um, a disturbing time, and a time of beginnings for for the India that uh, I enjoy coming back to today. I remember very much in Vasant Vihar the cable television wars. Some of you may remember those. When cable first arrived in a slightly unruly state, there would be a knock on your door. Some thuggish-looking man would say, I'm here to install your cable. You'd negotiate the terms. He'd install the cable. About a week later, you'd hear a rustling out in the trees, some shouting in the street, people chasing each other. The next day, someone would knock on the door, I'm here to install your cable from a new company. And there was a kind of uh, territorial battle all across the neighborhoods. Now I come back, I look out my window, and I see the metro and the flyovers, and I'm reminded just how much progress has unfolded since uh, that time. But one of the reasons I really loved it out here and love coming back is because of the connection between the political economies of India and the constitutions of India and the United States. And both of the founders of our countries, uh, the groups of men mostly, who wrote these constitutions, had in mind um, development in an open system, uh, development that might sometimes be slowed down by argument, by conflict, by openness. Um, and they trusted that there would be a series of checks and uh, sources of transparency in this constitutional system that would include the press. You know, someone who spent more than 30 years as a professional journalist enjoyed a lot of uh, privilege and, and had a lot of good luck. At this point at Columbia, I spend a lot of time reflecting on what it is uh, that makes journalism credible in a constitutional system. How does it, re how does it renew its place in the, in the system that the founders of both of these countries imagined. And I want to talk a little bit about that uh, in the time that I have today. I want to start by um, telling a story about another editor. At Columbia, I come to work every day aware that the school that I'm stewarding and the, and the prizes that are administered down, down the hall uh, were created by a man named Joseph Pulitzer, who's whose name and whose commitment to excellence in journalism is now well known around the world. But what's not very well known is who Joseph Pulitzer actually was and how it was he ended up uh, with this vision of fact-based professional journalism that he endowed in this school at, at Columbia more than 100 years ago. So let me just tell you his story because like Vinod Mehta, it's not the story of a man from the elite. It's not the story of a man with heirs. It's a story of a journey, which is often a part of a journalist's life, and, and of a discovery late in life of certain values and principles that ended up becoming very influential in the United States. 
So Joseph Pulitzer was born in Hungary in 1847. His family was uh, well off when he was a young man. He was tutored in German and French, but his brothers died one after another. His parents died. He found himself all alone as he was coming of age. And it turned out that he answered a newspaper ad that was related to the American Civil War. So late in the Civil War, uh, President Lincoln imposed conscription, a draft, because the toll of the war and the, and the political controversies building in the, in the Union in the North were making it difficult to bring enough volunteers to the fight. So he imposed a draft, but with a catch to prevent uprisings. The catch was you could pay someone to substitute for your conscription. So wealthy families in New York started taking out advertisements in Europe looking for mercenaries to come in and serve in place of their sons. And when Joseph Pulitzer, at 19 or 20, bereft of most of his family, looked in the newspaper, he saw an ad, and he decided to sign up. So he went to New York, speaking only German and French, no English. And he found another group of mercenaries who had also answered these ads. They were all German-speaking. They formed a cavalry unit on horseback in 1864, toward the end of the war. They ended up fighting in the Shenandoah Valley, just to the, I guess, the southwest of Washington, D.C., quite close to the capital. For a year, they rode up and down the, the valley, all together on horseback, speaking German uh, to Virginians. Uh, they didn't get into much of a fight. The war ended, and they were all mustered out and told, well, now you're Americans. So if you wish to be. Uh, and Pulitzer still didn't speak much English, and he heard that in St. Louis, there was a German-speaking community. So he went west to St. Louis, great city on the Mississippi River, and he found a community of politics and journalism that attracted him. And at that time, journalism in the United States, as in many parts of the world, still today, was very partisan. It was really an arm of political parties and, and an expression of political competition. And of course, this was the frontier, this was the West in the United States, so it was not often polite competition. The principal battle then, as now, was between the Democratic and the Republican parties. The Republicans in St. Louis were seen as the Northern Aggression Party. The Democrats were seen as a more local party. Pulitzer became a Democrat. He bought a newspaper called the St. Louis Post that ended up lasting for quite a long time, still published uh, today, um, though in diminished form. And he became an investigative reporter. He learned enough English to edit a paper in English, and he started attacking graft and corruption that he saw in local officials, of course, almost always in Republican local officials, because he was a Democrat running for office, and all of his friends were Democrats. But he found the Republican opponents that he was competing with to be utterly corrupt and needed to be exposed. So week after week, he would publish these deep investigations of their conflicts of interest, their payoffs, their bribery. And one day, um, a subject of one of his stories uh, became aggravated that uh, he had been exposed in this way. He didn't believe the story was accurate. That sometimes happens in journalism. And he marched over to the offices of the St. Louis Post, and he pushed past, past the receptionist, and he demanded to see the editor. And Joseph Pulitzer came out of his office, and they fell into a very heated argument about the accuracy of this investigative story. And at the end of the argument, Pulitzer pulled out a pistol and shot the man. <laughs> he shot him in the leg, actually. Now, this is the founder of the Pulitzer Prizes, just to give you a sense that there was a little bit of rough and tumble in journalism in, in St. Louis at that time. This being the West, he was not actually uh, jailed for shooting the man. He was fined, and uh, his friends pulled some money together and paid off the fine. It later became a subject that kind of hung over his head as he made his fortune. So after some time, and not just to escape this, uh, this shooting charge, he moved to New York and he bought a newspaper that became the greatest newspaper of its age in New York, the most financially successful, the most innovative, um, and that made his fortune and put him in the position to, to endow Columbia Journalism School and the Pulitzer Prizes. And that, that paper was called The New York World. It's not much remembered. It went out of business uh, in the mid-20th century. But at the peak of its power, uh, between, say, 1880 and, and 1915, 
It was um, a remarkable paper, not just because it dominated New York circulation and, and uh, the New York press scene, but also because of its innovations. It was the first paper to print color comics. It emphasized illustrations. It was a paper with a populist streak that favored the new immigrants arriving in the country over the old established uh, elites. It had a popular tone, but also a kind of rigor about its reports that ended up influencing Pulitzer. I think if you'd read The New York World in 1895, you would not have predicted that Joseph Pulitzer would have become one of the most influential intellectual patrons of, of fact-based journalism. But as he reached the end of his life, he became um, very reflective about what journalism was in a democratic society, in a constitutional society. He was um, in some suffering toward the last years of his life. He was blind. He was very sensitive to noise. He spent a lot of time by himself. And eventually, he pulled together um, some ideas about the future of journalism that turned out to be remarkably prescient, not just in the United States, but in many other countries influenced by Anglo-American traditions. He pulled these ideas together, and he wrote them up in an essay in a, a magazine called the North American Review in 1904. And if you ever come and visit Columbia University and come to the journalism school, you'll see a few quotations from that essay on our walls, because what Pulitzer did long before people talked about journalism as a, as a function of a constitutional society, long before people thought of journalists as professionals, before they thought of them as a profession that required ethics, that required a commitment to truth-seeking, that required uh, reliance on scientific method and facts. None of this was true about journalism in 1904, but in this essay, Pulitzer sketched out a vision of how it might come into being and why it was necessary for the health of the Republic of the United States. And the main argument that he made was that journalism could become a profession alongside law and medicine and accounting and other professions that were emerging at that time, and that if it did, it could inform the public, hold powerful individuals and institutions to account, and essentially play the role that the writers of the American Constitution imagined the press could play, which would be to strengthen the public square, to, to strengthen civil society, to strengthen the electorate, and to provide, along with the judiciary, a check on powerful institutions, politicians, and corporations. But he wondered whether this vision that he sketched out so articulately in this essay would come to, come to bear or not. And he kept asking these questions in the essay, whether 70 years from now, I don't know why he chose that time frame, but he said, well, 70 years from now, shall we preserve the government of the Constitution, the equality of all citizens before the law, and the purity of justice, or shall we have the government of either money or the mob. And he went on to say, I don't really know whether this vision I'm uh, offering will be taken up. I'm not even sure if Columbia University will accept my endowment. In fact, for Harvard turned him down, and for a long while, Columbia was reluctant to establish a, a leading school of journalism because they weren't sure that journalism was worthy of a university. Well, it happened in the end that Columbia accepted his vision, was actually moved by his vision, and it happened in the end that journalism evolved gradually from a rather unruly, sensationalist, uh, populist profession into one that also included very serious, public-minded uh, institutions like Outlook, like the New York Times, like the Washington Post. And the irony that I hadn't reflected on before I went back to reread this essay in preparation for tonight is that exactly 70 years after that essay was published, right, 1904, what happened in the United States in 1974? It's the summer Richard Nixon resigned because of reporting in the Washington Post by a couple of professional journalists, one of whom, Bob Woodward, was as well-educated and well-prepared for professional life as any public servant in the United States, Yale University, United States Navy officer, and then he decided to become a reporter and it was because he was equipped with the professional skills, the education, the sensibility 
to follow the money all the way to the end, he was able to expose one of the most abusive administrations that the United States has had to endure, but through constitutional means contributed to its end. So I think uh, what Pulitzer understood and what he really outlined for our profession was that the, that the rights contemplated in constitutional systems for the press are inseparable from the other rights that were contemplated at the same time. The press is not a special category of civil right or of empowerment of the people to hold and govern their own institutions, to hold their own institutions accountable. It is part of a system that includes the, the judiciary, independent prosecutors, public opinion, elections. And we see this now in the United States. Um, I want to come back to the subject of Donald Trump. I imagine one or two of you might be interested in some thoughts on that. I must say, I'm rather tired of talking about our president. He's been in office for seven months. To some of us, it does feel like seven years. But um, there's something happening in the constitutional functioning of the United States in these seven years, including the press, that I think worth, is worth reflecting on in, in light of um, this idea that Pulitzer offered and which many of us now take for granted that journalism uh, has a role to play uh, in, an, in an open constitutional system. So one of the questions, though, before we come back to that, that I wanted to embrace is one that you hear a lot in, in a journalism school, and I'm sure when you talk about India's media. How is it that this public-minded, public-interested function of journalism, this constitutional function of transparency, investigative reporting, speaking truth to power, creating fora for diverse opinions, unpopular opinions, how is that supposed to coexist with sensationalist, irresponsible, noisy, if not fake news, distorted news, um, amateur reporting, a lot of shouting on television. How is it that we're supposed to understand the responsible role of the press when so much of the media is transparently um, populist at best, irresponsible at worst? And I just think from a journalist perspective, it's important to, to say, as Vinod Mehta understood, and it's, it's in his memoirs, you know, the serious press has always existed alongside the popular press. This has been true uh, from the beginning of pamphleteering and argument and the printing press. It was true at the time Joseph Pulitzer started to reflect on what a professional press could become, and it's true today. And there are different kinds of failure or sensationalism or popular strategy in media that I just want to inventory briefly before we talk about this larger subject of fake news, because I think it's important, first of all, to say that there has always been a popular press alongside a ser serious press, and secondly, that the character of the popular press is not always threatening to the health of our democracy. It may be irritating, it may be noisy, but not all of the popular press is a threat to the health of our public square. All of us in the United States, I'm sure many of you have visited there, you might even have once in a while gone to a grocery store and as you were checking out, noticed the tabloids alongside the cash register, the National Enquirer and the others. I went back and pulled out some headlines to remind myself of what you used to see when you checked out Hillary Clinton adopts alien baby and it had a, like an official photo of her holding a like something from E.T. the movie. Now you could find a dozen of those headlines on any uh, grocery stand in the United States for the last 40 or 50 years. Do, are we to believe that the, that the people who bought those uh, newspapers actually credited the truth of these stories? Of course not. You know, there's always a, a certain amount of sensational journalism um, that 
is designed to be entertainment, and there's a sort of agreement of suspension of disbelief between publisher and audience around the entertaining function of, of that kind of journalism. Where it becomes dangerous is where it becomes propaganda. And there is a difference between, I want to argue, between sensational entertainment and, and deliberate propaganda. We don't want to detain ourselves with a political science argument about exactly where to draw the line, but I think it's a place to begin, is that a propaganda campaign is designed to manipulate public opinion or to manipulate political outcomes. And what's happening to media today in the digital world, both in the United States and in India, is that the line between popular entertainment, sensational, flawed, but acceptably free journalism, and outright propaganda is blurring. And it's also difficult to distinguish because so much of the undertaking of this work is being done through automation, through algorithms, through bots, and in spaces that are very, very difficult for readers to see or to assess or to judge. I don't believe this problem is going to get better anytime soon. I think we're in for a period of deliberately manufactured propaganda campaigns, sometimes within countries, sometimes offshore. And we're likely to be in a period where the technology associated with those campaigns is going to be more sophisticated than the audience's ability to discern what is going on, or even to distinguish a credible from an incredible source. So we've moved way beyond the Hillary Clinton alien baby headlines. We're in a dangerous moment. Now, what do we do about it? We started with these constitutional systems that were based on the primacy of openness, that were willing to accept a certain penalty for the amount of argument we have, for the amount of conflicts we endure, for the diversity of voices that we privilege. If we face propaganda campaigns that are truly dangerous to the health of our democratic system, are we meant to shut them down? If we do that, how much other speech will we suppress? And what is the mechanism by which we empower either a company like Facebook or a government to distinguish between propaganda and legitimate speech? It's a very difficult question uh, to answer in a way that would give you any confidence in such a regime. You're almost certainly going to move very quickly into a form of censorship. Now, certainly there have always been kinds of speech even in the radical First Amendment society of the United States, which is by far the most permissive of these open society regimes, there's always been certain kinds of speech that has been qualified for privilege. Speech that incites violence, speech that mobilizes hatred. Although the bar for stopping such speech in the United States is high, there is a bar, and it's similar to the kinds of restrictions that you would find in Europe or indeed in, in India. But setting violent inci incitement of violence aside, we're talking about a different problem of manipulated news, manipulated public opinion, propaganda campaigns. If we try to shut those down on principles similar to the prohibitions against inciting violence, we're very quickly going to be shutting down lots of other speech at the same time. There's something glorious about a society that is informed by truly free speech, even nutty, irresponsible speech. In the United States today, I'm sure you see when you visit, some of the best news and even some of the best investigative reporting is being created by satirists. The Onion, John Oliver's show on HBO. Sometimes it's very difficult to tell whether an Onion headline is an Onion headline or a New York Times headline? I went and uh, pulled together five or six of them, and I, here's one. I would, I would defy you, if you were reading this, visiting New York, to immediately recognize whether it was the New York Times or the Onion. Or the Onion. It says, Trump blasts critics who judge neo-Nazi groups by most extreme members. So the claim journalism makes on credibility in a democratic constitutional system doesn't lie uh, in, around 
the capacity for that system to provide space for free speech. There's something else going on in the, in the editorial decision-making of Outlook and in the claims that professional journalism make on constitutional privilege. And that is a journalism based on facts, a journalism based on impartiality, a kind of scientific method, fairness, truth-seeking, no matter how imperfect such a pursuit must inevitably be, given our human limitations. So we take this idea of fact-based journalism for granted, and our, our colleague, our sponsor, or the uh, chief executive used that term, I think, fact-based journalism, credible journalism. We take it for granted, but we have to recognize that this is actually, in the history of arts and letters and journalism, in the last four or five centuries, this is an unusual tradition to have journalism that is devoted to the scientific method. And it's also a distinctively Anglo-American tradition. It came out of um, the search for evidence in courtrooms in, say, 17th century Britain. It came out of um, the need in commerce-based capitalist societies for accurate information about shipping, when things were coming and going, what prices were. In the American tradition, it came, the transition from partisanship to fact-based press happened out of technology, happened out of market incentives. When the telegraph was invented, somebody made a business out of transmitting news quickly around the country to newspapers that were like the one Joseph Pulitzer won. Ran. They were in gun battles over partisan disagreements, but they all needed access to the same facts at the same time, so the wire services developed this neutral, very careful, very accuracy-based system of, de of delivering the basics for everyone to argue about. This Anglo-American idea of professional journalism that was related to the scientific method was passed through to countries like India that then converted it into their own nationalist press, their own independence um, movement press. And so this, this tradition has spread far beyond the Anglo-American origins, but it's not common. It's not part of the history of journalism in France or Italy or many other places that have had journalism, professional journalism, for a long time. So the first thing to say about this, this idea that we're all taking for, for granted is that it's it's unusual. It's also young. In the United States, the press enjoys privileges and protections unlike in any other country. But even though the First Amendment is more than two centuries old, the protections that journalists at the Washington Post or at the New York Times enjoy, and which President Trump has been attacking rhetorically, at least so far, really only date to the 1960s. The reason the United States journalism enjoys such unusual protections is because of a libel law case that was settled in 1964, because of the Pentagon Papers case that occurred in 1971. If you look back at jurisprudence, even in the 1920s, the United States was putting presidential candidates in jail for suggesting that people um, avoid the draft. Um, a socialist candidate for the, pres for the presidency uh, was put in jail during the First World War for that very reason. So the First Amendment did not contemplate this kind of space for journalism until very recently, and that to me says in the long arc of history, it's fragile. This is not a deep 200-year commitment to the role of fact-based journalism in the public square. This is a really young regime that has yet to be as fully tested um, as many other parts of the Constitution have been. Now, the other thing that's put pressure on these protections and the role of journalism, the aspirations of, of Outlook, we also heard from our colleagues. The business has changed because of the digital revolution. Magazines and newspapers that enjoyed the stability per, to pursue this kind of journalism don't have the economic independence and stability that they enjoyed 30 or 40 years ago. The digital revolution has opened publishing to everyone. And out of that revolution has come a media that is increasingly tribalized. You see this in the United States. People tune in to the cable network 
or read the news outlets that confirm the opinions they already hold in a society that's increasingly polarized. You may find some of this in your own country. This has sprung up and intensified over the last five or six years. So why is this happening? Why do we see this movement from media that used to be inclusive, even if there was a center-left strategy or a, a, an identifiable positioning that media took? That has really intensified, certainly in my country, so that organizations like the New York Times that used to see themselves as published for everyone are now seen as very specifically ideological. Even though the editors and the reporters may not see themselves that way, the reality is that their audiences do. So I think there are three or four things that have made media become tribalized. Uh, and I imagine that some of them are relevant here. First, underlying polarization in our politics. The United States is more polarized today, objectively more polarized, more divided into like-minded communities that intensively uh, oppose other communities than, than was true 20 or 30 years ago. Some of this in the United States has happened by migration. People have moved into communities to live next to people who think like them. Uh, and this has created pockets of the United States where every presidential election no matter who's running, is decided by 20 points or more in many, many counties. Because there's no contest there. People have decided for reasons of faith or reasons of belief or reasons of education, social preference, to live next to people like them. And sociologists have shown this has really intensified in the last 20 years. The second thing is just the way our brains work. Scientists now have discovered that we have this property in our brains called cognitive bias. It means that we prefer to hear the emotionally pleasing confirmation of beliefs we already hold to being challenged with facts or assertions that we disagree with. Why do we have this in our brains? Because our survival as a species depended on solidarity, on hanging together, and so our brains are wired to take signals of solidarity and to, and to be emotionally reinforced by them. So one thing you learn as a reporter is if you want to avoid mistakes, you have to learn to get out of this emotionally pleasing loop of confirming what you already think and force yourself to be challenged by possibilities or facts that make you uncomfortable. The other big factor, and I'm sure this is present in the, in the world of Outlook and other media, is that in today's advertising market, in today's circulation market, it's not good enough to be smart, to be reliable, uh, to have breadth. Um, you need what the marketing people call engagement. You need an audience that is passionate. They need to really want to be with you. At the New York Times, subscribers charge, their, their subscription department charges very high prices. And the reason they, they receive that engagement is because New York Times readers are passionate about their involvement with the New York Times. They sell insider follow-ons to the subscription so you can hear the reporters talk about their experience as if you're living inside the newsroom. On the other end of the spectrum, you have Fox News, an emotionally uh, charged, uh, very transparently political cable television network one of the most profitable media companies in the United States, and one of the most valued channels on cable subscriptions, because what cable companies want are viewers who are passionate about at least one of the 500 channels on their set. And cable companies know that if they were to drop Fox News, they would be subject to a political revolution. And that engagement to them is more valuable than the demographics of the audience, or any number of other factors that would normally come into play. So you have this self-reinforcing tribalization in addition to the earlier factors that's based on business models. And it's, I can't see that it's going to go away. Now, a more partisan press is not necessarily bad. If it's honest, if it's credible, if it's independent of political parties and interested in truth-seeking, if it's not propaganda, this is, the tr this is the tradition in continental Europe. 
and it was long the tradition in America, as Joseph Pulitzer's story exemplifies. But the problem is that as journalism becomes more ideological, more polarized, it becomes for large sections of the public much less credible. It's therefore easier for governments to repress it or for corporate owners to manipulate it. And we are witnessing a wave of repression and co-optation of media around the world. You know, 10 or 15 years ago, even in, in authoritarian societies like China, the space for investigative reporting was really opening up, especially about subjects like corruption or conflict of interest. And journalists, independent journalists, even in places like Egypt and China and Turkey, were really testing boundaries. Today, all of that space is closed back up again. And there are enough reporters in jail in Egypt and Turkey to staff a good-sized newspaper. Now, what about Donald Trump? What kind of a threat does he really pose? First thing you have to understand about him, if you don't already, is his own relationship with the press. He craves the press. He craves media attention. He has always cultivated press attention. That's been the secret to his business success. There was a time when he used to call up the New York Post, pretending to be Donald Press's press, press agent, to plant stories about Donald Trump in the, um, sorry, he used to call up the New York Post pretending to be Donald Trump's press agent in order to plant stories in the New York Post about Donald Trump. He has, he has a sophisticated sense of the press. He loves reporters if they love him. So he's not hostile in some innate way to the institutional role of the media. This is a political strategy that he's seized upon and that he's rolled with. But his words have meaning. And increasingly, they're changing the climate for journalism in the United States in two ways. One, they pose a threat. His rhetoric delegitimizes journalism as a check on his own power, as a legitimate part of our constitutional system. He's appointed an attorney general who's deeply skeptical about these, as I mentioned, young privileges that the press enjoys. And I wouldn't be at all surprised to see a reporter prosecuted for espionage during the Trump administration for collaborating with a source to obtain and publish classified information. The Obama administration started us down this road, and the Trump administration, I imagine, will go further still. Fortunately, most of American press laws are located in the states, but the more this rhetorical environment intensifies, the more likely state legislatures are to change the protections that have been enacted over the last 30 years for journalism. On the other hand, these attacks, often over the top on the press, in my experience over the last seven or eight months, have actually strengthened journalism in the United States. They've made clear to many, many reporters what it is they are supposed to do, why they have this constitutional role. And you can see in the, just if you read the New York Times and the Washington Post, it's difficult for anyone in the United States government today to draft an executive order or a proposed change of law and not have it land in a Washington Post reporter's inbox within about two or three hours. And you can also see that important institutions like the FBI and the Justice Department recognize that the integrity of, the, of their own investigations that they're carrying out under great pressure from a president who, who continually denounces the legitimacy of these investigations, that their own integrity depends on the transparency that a free press provides. These are not leaks without a purpose. The purpose is to make transparent to the full public what's going on and why an independent judiciary should be respected. So what are our solutions? I think we're going to have to take more risks than we have been forced to take to defend a free press with all of its imperfections, with all of its variety, to stand up for those rights even when they're unpopular and to renew our defense of independent journalism, fact-based journalism, impartial journalism, it's going to be a struggle. You know, the history of our societies, both of our societies, is that the preservation of rights is always a struggle. And these rights are intertwined. If you fail to defend one set of rights, you're likely to see another erode. This is going to be a time of testing. It's Remarkable for my generation in the United States because we've never known pressure like this uh, from a government, certainly not since the Nixon administration. I think we're up for it, but 
I don't want to underestimate how severe these tests are going to be and how much courage they're going to require from journalists to defend their own, their own place in this system and their own credibility under very difficult attacks. And so in the end, what we ultimately need are more and better journalists, independent journalists committed to the traditions that Vinod Mehta modeled and created at Outlook and which the magazine continues to follow today. It's been an honor to talk with you about some of these ideas uh, that informed Vinod Mehta's career. And I thank you for listening. I appreciate it. Thank you.